This is Cthonia, the world of the dark feminine. Hello, and welcome to Cthonia, the podcast dealing with the dark feminine. I'm your host, Breechberg, and this week we're going to talk about Dionysus uh, again. This is part two. Uh, I did part one for the last podcast, and if you haven't heard that, it might be worth grab- having a listen to that before you listen to this one so that you can have the context for where where we're going with this, because I started last time talking about the Homeric view, um, Homer's view of Dionysus, and this time we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about the Orphic Dionysus. And this is the Dionysus that I think a lot of people, um, people who are particularly interested in esoteric practices, know the best. Uh, this is the Dionysus associated with the mystery cults. Um, this is the Dionysus that's associated with Platonic and Middle Platonic thinking, and ultimately with the changes in our beliefs about life after death and the afterlife. And also about the connections between Dionysus and Jesus. Okay, there's um, so so I want to. I think the best way to take this is to try to go chronologically to some degree. Uh, where I want to start now, just a reminder: if, if you haven't heard the previous podcasts, just you know, just to clarify, Dionysus is the god of wine. Uh, he's also known as Bacchus in the Roman, and he has several other names as well. Uh, you know, based on his characteristics in different parts of the world. And Dionysus as a god is he he represents a sort of god form. He is he's androgynous, okay, which hence, hence his connection to the feminine and to the underworld. He's a very liminal figure because he's connected with agriculture as the god of the vine. Um, but he's also ends up becoming an Olympian, as we've said. He ends up moving up uh, with the gods on Mount Olympus, which to me represents his, uh, the mainstreaming of Dionysus, or the way in which uh, the energy and power of the mystery cults and, and what they were, you know, that, that sort of transformative power, um, when, Dion- when it becomes embodied in Dionysus as the one who can provide, you know, as a provider or an initiator into that power that allows you to overcome death, uh, that, that gives him uh, that that gives him a, a much different status than that of the um, the foreigner, who one has to be um, careful about. And if this story sounds it's very similar to one that we know with, uh, well, if, if it sounds very much like somebody you know a fisherman from Galilee, who was um, you know supposedly had this this virgin birth and and so forth. Uh, that that comes from Galilee, and you know where, wherever he goes, you know he he has a certain set of disciples, but there's only the traditional people looking to challenge him, and challenge his his status as as a good Jew or as a good you know um, you know as somebody who's righteous in some fashion, because you know oh you don't observe the Sabbath this way or you don't do this or you don't do that. Uh, people always questioning the uh, what we now think of as the divinity of this particular person. And then of course, so this person is um, crucified, but then they're brought back to life. Uh, so, and, and I think you know who I'm talking about. I don't think I even have to uh, to say the name because that, but then of course now it's sort of taken for granted. The divinity of this individual is taken for granted uh, in the Christian religion. So how did, you know, so what we're going to see is a very similar journey with Dionysus. And this gradual move of Dionysus from being um, this sort of deity of the lower classes, this deity having to do with freedom, having to do with wine, which of course, you know, everybody drank wine, but wine also had the property of, uh, of loosening the tongue, of making people, you know, of pulling people out of the social norm or the social order. And... You know, so so the fact that this is happening with this particular god, and then then you know you start later seeing Dionysus become associated with Apollo, so it becomes associated with this uh, solar kind of um, energy, which is more uh, cosmic, I suppose, rather than earthly. And this, you know, and, and the associations there, and, and the way in which um, his his connection to the ideas of the immortal soul, and to you know, to, you know, to the way that, you know, to, to this kind of freedom and what we later would think of as salvation. 
um, it, it makes him a really interesting bridge figure because there's a lot of characteristics of Dionysus that you would not think, um, you know, you, you would not think that he would be the one to bridge us into monotheistic religion and this kind of view of life after death about heaven, hell, and punishment. So, you know, so while Dionysus worship isn't directly responsible for that, it is very clearly represents a shift in thinking. So, okay, so we talked about Dionysus, we talked about his status as a foreigner, we read some of the Homeric hymns. Now I want to talk about the Orphic myth. So that's the place that we need to start. So the Orphic cosmogony of Dionysus. In this particular myth, okay, there's, there's always the myth of succession uh, among the gods. And so, of course, originally it was Oranus. Um, now the Orphics do have some slight differences in, in the way that they perceive it. Uh, they perceive uh, Phanus or time as being uh, one of the you know supreme deities, as as well as night or Nyx is also considered to have uh, some kind of supremacy that is then passed on first to Kronos, okay, who um, Kronos or Saturn, whose mythology is you know, is, uh, you know he castrates his father, uh, but then as his children are being born, who are who are the Greek gods. Uh, he continually swallows his children because he doesn't want anybody succeeding him. Zeus is eventually smuggled away and he's given a sw stone to swallow instead. And then Zeus, you know, grows up, rises up, overthrows his father. And now Zeus is the, uh, the, the king of the gods, the, the king of the universe, as it were. And now, and Zeus's successor in the Orphic version is Dionysus. Okay? And in this, that version... Dionysus is not the son of Zeus and Semele. He is the son of Zeus and Persephone. So Persephone uh, gives birth, and Persephone is, is Zeus's niece, yes. But um, again, the whole incest and mythology thing is a completely different topic, um, and, and it's, its meaning and so forth, which, I, which like a lot of things with myth is not what, what it apparently would be on an ethical and social level. Um, the per Persephone is uh, so Persephone gives birth to Dionysus, and he and Zeus holds up this child as the successor, and it kind of makes sense because if Persephone is a representation of the underworld, if she's a representation of you know, and she's also a goddess associated with spring and the flowering of the earth, because you know during winter she's underground with uh, with Hades, and then she um, goes to meet her mother again, and then that's when you have spring and summer. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Persephone, so Persephone, so this idea of the merging of the earth and the sky in Dionysus uh, makes makes a lot of sense, really, uh, in, in a symbolic, in the kind of symbolic way that mythology operates. So what happens, though, is that the Titans, who, of course, were around, um, you know, the Olympians are now the rulers, but the Titan gods are still around. And the idea that this child Dionysus would be their success, would be the successor to the universe makes them very, very jealous because they feel they've been around longer and they should be the ones to, to take control, you know, when Zeus, whenever Zeus would step down or, you know, no longer be, no longer be king of gods. So in their jealousy, they lure Dionysus, who's an infant at this point, he's a little child. They lure him away with some toys and then they put him in a pot, they cook him, they dismember him and they eat him. Okay. So Zeus, of course, finds out about this, and he and Athena race to rescue the child. And he's already been devoured, but they are able to rescue his heart. And from his heart, he is actually recreated. Okay, they actually manage to re they manage to rebuild him from his heart, and it is Athena. Um, now she, of course, is the goddess of divine wisdom as well as craft. So she, you know, in a way, it, it, there, there, there's sort of a parallel there to the Zeus Metis thing, uh, or uh, Metis, who's the goddess of wisdom, the Titan of wisdom who uh, is, after she becomes pregnant, um, Zeus gets a prophecy that he's going to be overthrown by that child, so he swallows Metis. And then Athena is born out of his forehead, Athena being the child of Metis and Zeus. So, um, <clears throat> so, so he's, so, the, so the, okay. So Athena ends up playing this role as, as the, you know, she's, she's the, she's a virgin goddess herself, but, but she, you know, so there's this, again, there's this, um, this virginal goddess who ends up rebirthing Dionysus through the use of his heart. Uh, now, of course, now to punish the Titans for doing this deed, Zeus decides he's going to, uh, he takes his lightning bolt and he strikes them and he reduces them to ashes. 
uh, the, the Titans who are responsible. We don't ever learn which Titans are responsible. It's just, quote-unquote, the Titans. And it's often theorized, um, and again, I don't know if this is 100% proven, but it has been theorized that the, uh, the word Titan uh, comes from a root word for clay. Okay, and, this, and, and the reason I think this is at least probable, or at least that this is the way the Orphics interpreted it, um, we'll see when we talk about Dionysus initiation rituals. Uh, or baptisms, which is what they were. Uh, there's a the term clay, and you know, and we of course can think about the idea of clay uh, as as being the, for example, Yahweh in, in the Old Testament supposedly he creates man out of clay and then breathes life into him. Okay, is this idea of of clay as the as the as the substance? You know, you're you're made of earth, you're made of clay, right? Well, in this version. Um, after Zeus uh, zaps the Titans with a lightning bolt and sets them basically on fire and burns them to ashes, um, out of the ashes, uh, mortals are created. So that is how humans come to be. And the Orphic idea is that because humans are, um, they, have a par they, they have a partially titanic nature, okay, which is where their, their wickedness and their jealousy and all their bad impulses and vices come from, from this, uh, from this titanic uh, idea. Um, but they also, because they ingested Dionysus, okay, because they actually ate the flesh of the god, um, they've also, in, you know, in now part, they're also mixed up with elements of the divine. Uh, in particular, the divine successor to Zeus, the, the, the quote-unquote son of god, if you will. Okay, if you're, again, if all of this is starting to feel very familiar, especially if you're Catholic, and you go, wait a minute, don't people ingest the body and blood of Christ? Yeah, they do. Um, that's, that's the idea of transubstantiation, that you take a, you know, common bread and common wine, and that through uh, a magical ritual, really, you are transforming it literally into the flesh and blood of the, of the, of the, di of the dying God, or the dying and the resurrected God, Okay. Um, dying and resurrecting gods, the, the, the um, analogy there goes back even farther because obviously you can look at God, you can look at uh, figures like Adonis, for instance, or or Attis, who are um, you know favorites of <clears throat> certain female goddesses or certain um, like Adonis is the favorite of Aphrodite and Persephone, and Attis is the favorite of the goddess uh, Kybele, and both they're both killed, um, one of them by accident, the other quite literally out of jealousy. But in both cases, the, the, the blood of the dying uh, man is then turned into some kind of a flower, like they're resurrected in, in, in the fruits of the earth. Okay, so you see that idea of um, the blood becoming the, you know, the, the stuff, uh, the, the fundamental stuff of being, um, of, of, of life and of, and of allowing human beings to discover their own divinity within. Okay, and this is a very, very common um, Gnostic concept, very esoteric concept. The idea that uh, you have a connection to the God, you know, that it's not just uh, gods are here and humans are here. You know, you are connected. Um, you're not completely subject. You you have you have a divinity within yourself. And and idea in the Orphic system is that this is how that comes to be. Um, <clears throat> we see a reference to the Titanic and Dionysian nature of humans in Plato's Republic. This is one of the places we see it. About you know, he talks about. Um, you know, the idea of coming from clay or coming from the Titans, uh, you know, you know, you know, he refers to the wickedness of the Titans in their deed. And it is believed, of course, that Plato was an Orphic uh, adherent. Now, Orphism, the, the earliest text, now I think the Derveni Papyrus, which is probably the oldest discovered Orphic text, might have been the 5th century BCE. Okay, and it, it's believed to come out of beliefs that have, um, that moved eastward particularly Zoroastrian beliefs, and perhaps perhaps some Far Eastern beliefs. I mean, you might be able to make a case for it. I don't know that anyone really has. But nonetheless, you have this, I mean, there's definitely a very Persian flavor, a uh, very Zoroastrian flavor to um, Orphic belief, okay? And uh, it was said that Pythagoras was probably one of the first ones who brought that, uh, who, who really developed that idea in the philosophical schools, because it's the philosophers that actually, actually took these kind of Zoroastrian ideas, merged them with Greek ideas about religion, and, and started to come up with this new way of thinking about um, about humanity, about about life, about the soul, and about life after death. And they're the first, and this is of course where you start to see the origin of the idea of judgment after death. 
because Zoroastrianism is a dualistic religion. It's based on the idea of a battle between good and evil. So there's always this sense of, um, so, so in other words, the, the sense would be here that as a good Orphic or as a good philosopher, as Plato um, mentions, when he, Plato's vision of Ur is, is a very interesting read. If you read nothing else in the Republic, it's probably worth a read. Um, because he, first of all, he talks about the idea of, um, you know, it, it's it, it, a type of reincarnation of souls. But the idea is um, that the souls, when you die, uh, depending on your, your actions in life, <clears throat> you will either go through a period of punishment or a period of reward. And, of course, he talks about people who are going to meet their reward, like, of course, all of the philosophers, because, you know, they're the exemplars of, of, of good rational behavior. Uh, this, is, this is the introduction of rationality into religion. Uh, this is no longer about um, just... Uh, I mean, Plato wasn't against the divining of oracles and state religions. Like, he wasn't event against any of that. He, he certainly believed all that. But he's the first one to really, I mean, in, in a big way, and, he, and not the only philosopher, but in the first one in a big way to talk about Greek religion, <clears throat> um, talk about God or talk about the idea of a king of the gods like Zeus as being an embodiment of the good. Okay, that was not, that, that was not necessarily assumed in the past. And, of course, this is when you also start seeing the philosopher saying, you know, isn't it shameful that Zeus cheats on his wife? Like, that's when you start seeing the ethics being applied to it, because now there's a moral judgment not only being made on humans, but being made on the gods, and that these moral judgments carry over into death. Okay, so this is where this idea starts. Now, the mystery cults, there's two main mystery cults that, that we know of. Uh, the cult of Dionysus, uh, which supposedly was founded by Orpheus, who which the name Orphic, the Orphic or Orphism comes from. Um, and also uh, there is the, um, what was it? There's, there's the, um, there's also the cult of Demeter, the cult at Eleusis, um, which is, has to do, which, whose rituals center around uh, Demeter's loss of Persephone. And of course I have a podcast about Persephone where I talk about that, but her, you know, the, the, the taking of Persephone by Hades, her going to the underworld, and then um, be, being reunited with her mother in the spring. That's another sort of idea of death and resurrection, as it were. So what the Orphics did, and by the way, I really need to note that Orphism is not a religion, okay? It, it, it's, it's more, um, Radcliffe uh, Edmonds, who wrote a book, uh, did a study of Orphism. He had said, you know, it's a little bit more like the way we tend to use the term New Age, you know, it covers a, a wide set of beliefs that are kind of sometimes overlap or, or become conflated with each other. Um, but it's not necessarily, it's not a religion. It's, it's basically like a movement. It's not a religion. And the Orphics, they, they had certain core beliefs. For one, the, the Orphics thought that souls were divine and immortal, but they had to condemn, live a succession of lives. So there we see uh, sort of a um, connection to the Hindu idea of samsara. The idea that you are born on the wheel of life again and again until you're liberated. Now, the way of life of the Orphics was aesthetic. And, uh, and their secret initiations that they underwent were means to escape this grievous cycle, as they called it, of birth and rebirth. Okay, and, and along with this, you know, again, because they believed you suffered some kinds of punishments after death, but then you were reincarnated. Okay, and that, um, and... and Plato explains this in great detail about, you know, um, being brought before the fates and then having lots cast, and then certain people will go forward and take their lots, and, you know, and they, you know, but they have to be careful what they choose, because, oh, I want to be a king in this next lifetime. Oops, I chose the one where I'm a king, and now I'm going to, um, but, but, I'm, but I'm going to be brutally murdered, and my life's going to be cut short. Oh, no. You know, so, he, you know, there, there was a whole thing about, you know, if you're, choosing the next life. Uh, one, one drinks from the river of forgetfulness to forget the old life, and now they're going to do the new one. Um, but the, the philosopher is the one, through the Orphic rites, you're, you're trained, first of all, not to drink from the river of forgetfulness so that you can remember all of the things you learned in the previous lifetimes, okay, and that you don't repeat the same mistakes. And also, there were, um, a lot of the Orphic uh, initiates were found buried with uh, gold tablets, either around their neck, usually around their necks. And uh, there, there's a whole, there's a whole um, study of these uh, that was done by, um, it was, I think it was Sarah Isles Johnston, and there was, um, oh gosh, who's the, who's the other person? I, I should know, it's a very, very famous name, but um, not coming to me at the moment. Anyway, I'm not going to belabor that. There's, there are studies of the Bacchic gold tablets, you can look those up. 
and but what the gold tablets had was they had little little formulae, little magical formulae uh, that you could recite. This is very similar to ancient Egypt when people, you know, when the pharaohs died, there was like there was a um, or or people who were royalty. A lot of the hieroglyphs on the wall are written there. They're the formulae that they need to recite when they go before the judges after death. Now, in this case, these particular um, gold tablets basically it told them the formulae for what they do. It's like, okay, you're going to get to Hades, and you've got to give the coin to Chiron, who takes you across the River Styx to the underworld, and you'll be asked to, you know, and, you know, you can go this way or this way, but you're going to go this way. And then when you go this way, you're going to be asked this. Don't, don't, don't say this. Or when you're confronted with this question, here's, here's your little cheat sheet, your little gold tablets, your cheat sheet. This is what you're going to say. And then you'll be admitted to the nicer part of the underworld, usually considered to be the Elysian Fields. Okay. Um, so in other words, you have, you have control over what happens to you after death. You don't have to just wander around in the gloom. Okay. So there's that, that was sort of the original idea there that you could, um, the, the initiate would know enough, would, would retain enough knowledge of uh of, of their soul and of what of, of what they learned and of what the, uh, and the knowledge of the underworld that would allow them to have more control over their destiny after death it wasn't just you know um because again the initial idea was not that the underworld was a place of punishment i mean it wasn't a nice place people weren't like looking forward to it like yeah i can't wait to die like nobody's looking forward to it but the idea is that you know um so there are some nicer parts, and so yeah, you could steer yourself to those nicer parts with just the right, the right formula and the right initiations, and you know, uh, usually involves the sacrifice of a pig, and so forth. And the initiation rituals themselves, obviously, they're secret. We don't know a whole lot about them. Um, but anybody who's been through a magical initiation would know that most initiations require, you know, there's a candidate who's brought forward. They're asked questions. They undergo some kind of an ordeal. Um, you know. And, you know, the ordeal is meant to be, um, well, it, it, it's meant to, uh, it's meant to test the person, uh, either emotionally or physically or something. It, it's a test that's involved. And then at the end of it, um, you know, the candidate's given new information. And then, of course, now it's like they've been reborn. Ah, you know, now you're, now you're like a new person. You've undergone an initiation and now you've transformed. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the formula, right? And so you do see this in the mystery cults. Everything that we know about the mystery cults suggests that um, for the initiate, there is a, you know, they're taken into a dark place and there's a secret to be revealed. Okay. So, you know, so the Dionysus cult, one of the things, I'm going to actually read this from uh, Rosemary Taylor Perry, who I quoted before. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Um, yeah. Okay, Dionysian rites, now I'm quoting from The God Who Comes, Dionysian Mysteries Reclaimed by Rosemary Ter Taylor Perry from Algora Publishing in 2003. Which is Dionysian rites, from which both the Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic branches of the early church borrowed heavily, include the rite of baptism, concepts of sacramentalism, and transubstantiation. And as I mentioned, transubstantiation is changing of bread and you know, wine to literal body and blood. And the observance of a Lenten period. Okay, there's the aestheticism. Baptism, either via immersion, immersion or sprinkling, was a common form of purification in pagan ceremonies. In the Dionysian Agri, or Lesser Mystery Rite, an initiate was daubed with chalky clay or lime in memory of the Titanic. Okay, that's what I mean. The idea that they, you know, the clay, that, that's where we have this uh, parallel between clay and Titan. In memory of their Titanic, which we now think of as fallen or sinful, nature at the outset. Ultimately, the initiate would have the white chrism moved by, removed by immersion in a bath. His subsequent clean condition symbolized his new oneness with the god Dionysus, whom the cannibalistic titans could not destroy. Okay, and in Christian baptism, the initiate is immersed first to symbolize a promised resurrection and imitation of Christ, whom men could not kill. Okay, and the daubings that come after immersion rather than before with a sanctified oil rather than this clay. And this marks a new Christian's unity with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it's it, they they reversed some of it. So it's not that, you know, you know you were, but but think about that. It's the idea that you were of earth before. And now you need to be purified. You need to be made pure, of your uh, your wicked nature. And anybody who's listened to this podcast for a long time knows that I have a real issue with ideas of you know pure purity and purification. Again, not that it's not. Um, 
you, you know, there, there are some times when purifying yourself is necessary, you know, when you want to get rid of things that you no longer need, that burden you, that hold you back, that hold you down. Obviously, we want to bathe every day and get clean and get rid of germs and so forth, but people can take that idea a little too far. So um, I, I tend to not be online with that. Okay, so that's, that, that's what we talk about when we talk about the mystery cults. And so, again, this starts with philosophers with a very masculine, rational approach to religion. You, know, you think of Plato, and then you think of all the, the philosophies that came after Plato. Um, the idea is being, it, it, it falls into the category of humanism. And humanism is the idea that the human being is not just, um, not just this little creature at the mercy of nature, but rather has, uh, you know, the, a, divine, a divine aspect of their own. And that, that divine aspect is usually expressed through rationality or the intellect. The fact that we can reason and we can do things like that, and um, that, that we tend to think that that makes us superior in some ways, that that gives us an edge over, say, the animals or, or, or other things. And uh, again, this is where these ideas originate. So, okay, so let's let's go back here and talk about some of these other connections here. I talked about the Apollo connection, okay, who, um, I'm just going back to what I'd said, um, Apollo and, and Dionysus becoming associated with the sun around this period. Olympiodorus speaks of Helios, who according to Orpheus, okay, had much in common with Dionysus through the medium of Apollo. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's this idea of them as, and, and it sort of makes sense because it's the idea of, um, by uniting with Dionysus, one becomes clear about their true nature, right? Um, and, and this of course is also what makes Dionysus an Olympian because he has more to do with the light rather than, you know, the sort of the dark underworld or the bowels of the earth. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so let's let's move on to the idea of Dionysus and Jesus because I think that's uh, that's somewhat important. Um, <clears throat> there is, uh, by the way, oh yeah, there, there's another there's there's a festival um, that I want to talk about in, in, in with respect to that called the Linnea Festival. I did a paper on this in Oxford um, a few years ago. Now uh, it's hard to believe how time flies, but it was a few years ago now, and the Linnea Festival <clears throat> is one. Uh, it, was, it, it was celebrated usually in February. It was a Dionysus festival, celebrated a temple of Dionysus. And one of the characteristics <clears throat> said to occur in this particular fe um, feast was that the water that flowed in the Dionysus temple would turn into wine. Okay. Um, and this is the first instance we see of the miracle of water into wine. And of course, hmm, who else did that? Um, can't imagine. Okay. Let's... Um, Okay, let's look at the, uh, we have the Dionysus and Jesus connection, <clears throat> and then I'm going to want to talk about the relationship of Dionysus and the Middle Platonists. And I'm taking a lot of this, some of it I'm taking from Rosemary Taylor Perry's book, others from the chapter that I've written for uh, De Natura Fide, uh, Dies Natura Fide, sorry, which is a book that I don't think has come out. <laughs> I, like I said, I put in my final edits and they were like, it's coming out imminently, and that was like last year, so I don't know. I'm not sure what's happened. Um, I have to find out from my editor. Academic tip books take a long time to publish, by the way. If you're working, if you're looking to publish things in academia, it can take years. So anyway, so I'm going to read from my chapter on Dionysus and Jesus, because uh, I feel like I more succinctly explain things here. Okay, so we see that Dionysian ritual has a cathartic function. Okay, it allows you to release um, chaotic side of you or pent-up emotions or feelings and attitudes that you're not supposed to have, right? And his association with the mystery cults as the Orphic successor to Zeus makes him a kind of savior figure, okay? One is, uh, you know, gets rid of their old nature and is reborn through this sort of baptism in Dionysus. Um, and I mentioned uh, Karenyi, who wrote a book on Dionysus, um, Carl Karenyi. He traces Dionysus' worship to Crete, an ancient Minoan civilization, where he was associated with the concept of Zoe or indestructible life okay um so again in, in, a, in a manner like shiva he's like he's a creator and a destroyer uh julius vertheim um cites a mystical aspect of the dionysus and linnea festival from the writings of pliny and posanius the changing of water into wine he quotes pliny on andros wine flows from the source of dionysus on seven days consecrated to the god if this liquid be taken outside the temple it changes to water 
We will never know if there's any truth to this claim or if some causal explanation. However, it is reminiscent of the episode of the wedding feast at Cana in John chapter 2, 1 to 11. The evangelist describes Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine. Overtheim suggests this is probably the Dionysus tradition at work. The miracle of the wine is not the only similarity between Dionysus and Jesus, and we're going to go into those. Um, the Orphic mythology of Dionysus makes him a kind of divine son and savior figure of humanity, as the divine spark in humans is what allows them potential immortality or reward after death. Uh, he gives hopes this he gives humans this divine hope of immortality through his death and resurrection. It's not difficult to see the Jesus parallels here. At some point in the late Roman Republic and into the Empire, uh, Dionysus, Bacchus, and Sabazius, okay, as I've mentioned, uh, Sabazius also, and if you're um, familiar with Philema, Philema you know, you'll, you're familiar with Sabazius, um, another, another Dionysus-like figure, uh, they all overlapped in that, that period of syncretism in the late Roman Empire with the worship of Jupiter or Zeus, well, Jupiter in this case, or Jove, when the Romans first encountered Judaism. Valerius Maximus makes reference to Sabazi uh, Iovis, and remember, they don't have a J, so that's Jovis um, in, in Latin, so, or Jupiter Sabazius, in a controversial passage appearing to link a merged Jupiter and Sabazius with the Jewish Yahweh. Uh, it's not clear that the syncretism was assumed, but it does appear to be at least one view that merges a Dionysian figure with the God of the Jews and later the Christians. And also might also explain, we mentioned that episode of the Roman Senate in 186 BCE, where they said, um, we're expelling um, Bacchus worshippers, Jews, and philosophers. So now maybe that makes some sense. Um, philosophers were influenced by Orphism. It's possible the Senate thought the Jews were as well. It may also be an example of religious relativism we, that um, is very prominent. Um, okay. So what are the parallels between Jesus and Dionysus? Well, I'll start here. Uh, it's notable that the Christian feast of the Epiphany on January 6th is also the feast day of Corre, another name for Persephone, the Orphic mother of Dionysus. Adrian Nocent cites St. Uh, Epiphanus, who suggests that the date in the celebration came from an Egyptian and Ar Arabian celebration honoring Corre as the mother of Aeon. Okay, and Aeon, uh, like Phanes, is, is a deity of time and is supposed to be one of the original... Um, rulers of the universe. And this is an Orphic deity, uh, very similar to the Persian deity Zorvan, associated with unbounded time and the sun. This may be another merging of Dionysus with another related Orphic figure. The myths of Dionysus inevitably involve resistance to accepting him as a god, from the trouble with his half-brothers to his abduction by pirates, all with catastrophic results for the non-believers. The trial and death of Jesus centers around the idea that he is an insurrectionist falsely claiming to be a king, though his violent death is followed by a victorious resurrection. Crucifixion is as horrific as dismemberment, and both represent the violent death of the god. The god is resurrected in both cases, and humans gain some kind of immortality or salvation as a result, though the narratives differ on the meanings as noted earlier. In John 15:5, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Several of his parables allude to the vineyard. Dionysus was noted for having female followers, and women played the leading role in the Dionysus cult. In the case of Jesus, Martha and Mary Magdalene, in, in case of Jesus, Martha and Mary Magdalene were among his closest disciples. And it is Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, in quotes, who see the angel at Jesus' empty tomb. Initiates into the Dionysus or Demeter mystery cults only sacrificed a pig. And Rosemary Taylor Perry tells us that the pig was supposed to absorb the evil deeds of humans like a sponge. In Matthew 8, chapter thir uh, verses 30 to 37, Jesus drives the legions of evil spirits out of a man and into a herd of pigs. Okay, so this is some of them. Now, what's some other ones? Well, I'm going to go back to her book for that because I didn't need to. I didn't need to list all of them there. I just needed to list um, some of them. Let me just find my uh, uh, my notes here on that. Because I have, uh, I, have se I have several different passages from this, so I want to make sure I get to the right ones. Okay, yeah, here we go. So, okay, so this is Rosemary Taylor Perry from The God Who Comes. Um, and this is on page, it's page number 25. Okay. She says, number one, semi-divine births of both Jesus and Dionysus were celebrated with late midwinter nativity festivals. Christ's birth was not originally given as December 25th, but as January 6th. Okay. the date which it is celebrated by the Eastern Orthodox Church and certain groups of American immigrants. And so therefore, again, 
uh, with this being the feast of Kore, that kind of makes sense because if, if um, you know, the mother of the god is celebrated on January 6th as well. Um, but it's that, it's that birth. It's that, that birth of the child that's, that's born. Both claim divine and human lineage consisting of famous and heroic ancestors as gods of eternal life. Okay, so obviously, and so in, it's in, because oh, in the in the original myth, Dionysus is the son of Semele, and incidentally, in case you're saying, hey, wait a minute, the Orphics believe that Persephone was his mother, but the others believe that Semele was his mother, that doesn't necessarily stop people from overlapping these things. Um, it's not as though these views were mutually exclusive, or you had to pick one or the other. Oftentimes, a lot of these views ended up kind of becoming merged and mixed up. There's not this idea that the god is this or that you can hear very contradictory stories of the same god. So that is not unusual in our um, in what we see in Greek myth, um, which comes from a variety of places, not, not just texts like those, say, that Homer had written or that Hesiod had written, but also in a lot of, the, like the writings of Pliny, for instance, where the, or even in the histories of Herodotus or things like that, where they'll mention things offhandedly. And then there are passages called scolia, which are really like footnotes, where, you know, they, they might refer to a story and say, and at the bottom it'll say something like, oh, you know, that story about, you know, uh, Dionysus and the Titans. Like, it'll it'll be mentioned there, like, yeah, obviously, the same thing I'm not going to talk about because everybody knows it, right? Um, this is where we piece together these stories. So it's not as though there's a, a smooth narrative somewhere. Okay. There's a desire in the tales of both deities for spontaneous, unprompted recognition as sons of God. For example, Jesus saying, who you... Who is it that you say I am, in combination uh, with the denial of their divinity by their own societies? Okay, so they're both, you know, and I had mentioned that earlier. And again, the idea of women is the first witness of miracles. Um, both are called, both Dionysus and Jesus are called by the appellations bridegroom and savior, and spoke of perfect oneness with their followers. Dionysus through drinking of wine and through these rituals, and, you know, or, or the fact that he was ingested in some fashion, okay? Um, and we also should note that in communion, I mean, you have the bread, but you have the wine and the wine is what connects you to the God. One of the connects you to the blood of the God. Uh, again, both symbolically correlated to the vine, um, turning of water into wine. We talked about that. Uh, the roles and titles of infant sacrificial animals like lamb of God were applied to both Jesus and Dionysus. The riding of donkeys as a form of triumphal entry was common to both of them. Um, both identified as granters of eternal life through similar symbols. Uh, the phallus was Dionysian symbol of life. Uh, the fish was used by early and modern Christians to distinguish themselves. Is also, uh, among, among other things, people would talk about how, oh, it, it's the notarikon for Christos or whatever, but it's also a symbol of the phallus, uh, the generator of life. And um, unconsciously in Jungian psychology, it's a symbol of the, of the divine self. According to most Miss ugh, According to most mythographers, the fish, the phallus, and the snake are interchangeable symbols of that force which gives life to the soul, or orgazine. Okay. Um, she mentions the pig being able to absorb the evil, which I mentioned. And both Dionysus and Jesus were capable of traveling from the underworld to the heavenly realm. Both were considered sacrificial gods whose worship made blood sacrifice obsolete. As Nonus related in pre-Christian writings, the Lord Bacchus wept to still the tears of mortals, reminiscent of Jesus' experience in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he, uh, he weeps and says, may this cup pass from me, but if, if it's not, then may your will be done. Okay? So, yeah, a lot of similarities between these two, uh, two deities. Now, uh, the other thing I want to talk about, um, the last piece I think I want to talk about here, because we're actually covering quite a lot of material, is the relationship between, um, is the sort of um, Middle Platonic and, and Neoplatonism and how this ends up affecting uh, the Christianity that we know and that also, you know, and that actually ends up being this, uh, you know, these, the, this, this uh, continuation of Platonism. And again, if you're, if you're interested in, you know, occult religion or esoteric practice, you know that um, the Platonic, you know, the idea of a Middle Platonic theurgy or Neoplatonic theurgy is very much part of, um, of you know, of, of occult practice. The idea of doing certain types of divination or doing certain types of um, 
certain types of spells and things. Theurgy was often more, and again, there's that T-H-E root from Theos, okay? That's more the idea of, you know, receiving direct answers or directly communicating with the god or spiritually developing oneself in that manner. Okay, that was, that was kind of the idea. Again, the much more rational approach. Sometimes you'll hear people refer to different types of magic. Well, they'll say, oh, well, the magic that is meant to... Um, edify and improve you and quote unquote raise you up the more intellectual uh, or the ceremonial magic you know that's that's more um you know that's the more refined one whereas you know all the that witchcraft stuff with the uh, with the herbs and the you know of course stuff dealing with the earth right you know you know the herbal things or for things like saying oh I, I want to make some money or I want to get back at my enemy and all that kind of stuff oh well that's lesser magic that's lower or black magic or you know well that deals with demons you know you, you're making packs with spirits it's like yeah well I think everybody's doing that <laughs> of one type or another and, you know, this tries to make distinctions between, yes, oh, we're dealing with angelic beings, not demonic ones, the ones from the sky, not the ones from the earth, right? So you start to see these kinds of distinctions come about when you introduce rationality into religion, okay? And the Dionysus cult sort of gets mixed up in this because of this sort of dual nature of Dionysus. Um, it makes him sort of appeal to both the intellectuals, but also to the, you know, he, he's represent, you know, rep representative of that, that earthiness. And it ends up being combined in this idea of the divinity within humanity, you know, that you're, you're free to be, you know, you're, you're not, you're not as confined as you think you are because you have your reason, you have this, you have that, but then you're also, uh, you have this divine spark in you that you just have to, you know, make the effort to connect to and understand, right? So here's my uh, my chapter on Middle Platonism here. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but um, just to give you some ideas. Orphism is the common denominator between Greek philosophy and this increasingly complex figure of Dionysus, and this combination has an influential role in the ethical shift in religion. In Plato's vision of Ur, um, I'm sorry, Plato's vision of Ur squares with the Orphic vision of the afterlife and the striving for a good and pure life at least partially altered uh, this at least partially altered the nature of ancient Dionysus worship. Greek philosophy not only offered pre-scientific ideas about the nature of the world and cosmos, but represented the first literary evidence we have that encour encourages living a pure and spiritual life for religious reasons. Again, which is not part of original Greek religion. In the Phaedo, Socrates says, if there is judgment for the wicked deeds in life, there must also be judgment in death. Similarly, there's the idea that the body is a tomb and humans must free themselves from the desires of the flesh. And Plato will say, now some say that the body, the soma, is the tomb or sema of the soul, as if it were buried in its present existence. And also because through its soul, um, makes it, it, the soul makes signs of whatever it wishes to express. For in this way, they also claim um, it is rightly named from, uh, uh, is that sema? Yes, from sema. In my opinion, it is the followers of Orpheus who are chiefly responsible for giving it the name, holding that the soul is undergoing punishment for some reason or other and has this husk around it like a prison to keep it from running away. Okay. And I noted here that um, this was not actually part of what you would call Homeric Greek religion. Only very wicked humans uh, were subject to punishment. Uh, the average person, regardless of moral standing or status uh, or social status, faced the same fate as everybody else. Perhaps this idea was too much to bear psychologically. It would not be surprising then that the Greeks adopted ideas about afterlife from the Egyptians and the Persians, and most notably the Zoroastrians. Sarah Isles Johnston, who has written, I've quoted her before in other places about um, uh, the restless dead and so forth. She's noted that the Greeks, like the Republican Romans, did not look favorably on beliefs from other cultures. So there had to be some compelling reason for them to in incorporate foreign religious views. Uh, this platonic view of valuing, valuing the spiritual over the material morphed into the idea that death was a celestial matter, celestial meaning in the sky. Hades, the Greek underworld, was moved to the sky. The moon was regarded as a stopover point for souls and was ruled over by the dark underworld goddess Hecate, now exalted as the cosmic soul, a pure and good spirit. And you can check out my um, podcast on Hecate. I think part two of that also talks about this. Souls who had achieved spiritual purity rose toward the sun, while others fell back down to the earth, the weight of their earthly desires still holding them down. Thus, we see the association of the sun with salvation. Middle Platonism covers the period from about 90 BCE to the 3rd century CE. Neoplatonism can only be understood with reference to this period, as a number of important esoteric works came from this school, including the writings, uh, writings of uh, Hermes Trismegistus and the Chaldean Oracles. Plutarch is one of the most well-known Middle Platonists. 
Plutarch's interpretation of Plato, which was meshed with other schools of thought, cherished a pure idea of God that was more in accordance with Plato. Nevertheless, he had to avail himself of a second principle in order to explain the constitution of the phenomenal world. This principle he sought, however, not in any determinate matter, but in the evil world soul, which from the beginning had been bound up with matter, the Titanic, right? And the creation, but in the creation was filled with reason and arranged by it. This association of matter with what is evil was taken up by other plate, middle Platonists, including Maximus of Tyre and Celsus, late latter branching out into Christian Gnosticism, believing God could not have influenced matter and there was a separate world creator or demiurge. Okay, so now we see the demonization of the world. I, you know, I talk a lot about um, the relationship between fear of death and fear of the feminine. Well, that's, there's, there's the crux of it right there. It's the idea that the earth becomes demonized and any connection to it. Um, you know, in, in Eastern religion, they talk about the connection to temporality. But, and it's amazing because when you think about how the Dionysus religion started, it started with basically a celebration of the sensual, okay? Like this catharsis of the sensual. And it ends up as being this, you know, as being incorporated later or influencing later as something that completely removes that. You know, that's, that's aesthetic, that, that, that separates things. And this, this has, you know, um, it was Jake Stratton Kenton who said this has a really profound psychological effect on the collective. I mean, when you start taking gods of the underworld and sticking them in the sky, um, it's not, it, it, it does something. And, it, and it's completely changed us and changed the way that we think about things. The, the absolute, um, I think the, uh, you know, the, the extreme point, okay, of this uh, separation of spiritual and matter came much later around the time of Dante's Inferno uh, in the Cathars, okay? That's probably the 11th, 12th century CE. You had the Cathars who believed all matter was evil and that no, no, nothing should ever be put into matter. Like you should not even have sex and procreate because you'll be bringing somebody into the world and they'll be in the flesh and boy, isn't that terrible. And of course the church put them down as heretics because you can't have a religion that says nobody should ever procreate. Because obviously there's that biblical injunction of be fruitful and multiply, right? So they would have caused the extinction of humanity if everybody followed the Cathars. So, you know, there's, there's this idea. And it's interesting, though, because a lot of modern um, occult schools have really picked up that, that you, know, you know, trace some of their lineage or some of their ideas back to the Cathars. And, I'm, and I think about that and I'm like, why? Like, why, you know, to me that, you know, I don't know. I think that's why I'm very attracted to the work of Jake Stratton Kent because he's his his whole thing is like you know stop stop disavowing this this part of um you know or start a stop acting like you're dominant over it you know there's there's this idea of building this relationship again with the earth and its deities who were the original deities they've just been displaced moved around and then demonized as new new gods take over so um but there's just, there's just a tremendous irony that that it happens through Dionysus but it probably happens because Dionysus again he's he's kind of both he's like a lot of the gods he's both but he has he has a, a specific nature that people gravitate towards um so there's a salvation and liberation from the social but that ends up being transformed by the institution into the um salvation uh from sin and death and from uh material concerns so it's weird how that totally gets flipped around. But that is where it originates. And this is where we see a lot of the Dionysus myth as related to Jesus in particular. So um, so if you, if you didn't know, now you know. That's how that, how that works. Um, okay. So I think I'm going to stop there. Um, I think this was quite a long, couple of quite long segments on this. But I think it's an interesting topic. And Dionysus' connection to the divine feminine makes him uh, a worthy topic here in uh, in Chthonia, because it's very hard to understand religiously how we moved from you know the feminine earth centered um, way of thinking about life and death to the more rationalistic judgment oriented way that we think about it now. Um, and it's not exclusively something that comes from Judaism and Christianity. It comes from the way um, aspects of Judaism were merged with all of these other things. Okay. And I'm certainly not listing all of the influences. I'm just listing a few of them. You know, we haven't even gotten into Mithraism or into the way that the um, the, the more uh, the Roman version of the Kibbeli cult or the, the other things. We're not we're not even I haven't even gone there because that's just a little bit too far afield. So, um, so we see so we see that how this um, belief in, about Dionysus uh, ends up changing the whole nature of the way. We see life the way that we see death, and when we get this concept of salvation, and I always think of, you know, 
it wasn't just Lon Milo Duquette who said it, but I just see him in my mind saying, salvation from what? You know? Um, because cause salvation now has taken on a whole other thing, like, oh, I'm such a terrible person, and my nature is just so awful, and I can't, you know, um, you know, and, and somehow the, my, my very existence should make me ashamed. Well, this is where those ideas originate, and... My message is, no, you shouldn't be ashamed of your existence. You need to learn to embrace every part of you, including the parts that aren't as socially acceptable or that people don't like. You have to find a way to integrate them anyway. And you want to focus on the things that are going to um, be the most helpful to you, and ultimately things that are going to be helpful to others. This is why we do suppress certain traits in ourselves. But ultimately, we want to um, do what's best. For, if we do what's best for us and what's best for society, then... Um, we're recognizing our relationship to the world and things are, are, are better as a result. But it's not just a matter of, of logically reasoning everything out. And, um, and I just see this kind of social and ethical thing being applied not only to religion, but to literature, to everything else, where everything is about um, the ethics of it. Oh, we don't like the Odyssey because uh, we don't look at Penelope. They're making her look like she needs to be this subservient woman who takes care of all these men. That you're missing the point. Just, <laughs> just you know that to to try to read everything in that light is a is a huge mistake. You need to look at the bigger picture. And um, because as because as we can see, it is far more complex and not as cut and dried as you would think. Um, and Dionysus is a perfect example. He's not um, you know, for a god who's associated with sex, you know, orgies and 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 you know, intoxication. Um, he's also a champion and defender of women and women's virtue. Okay, so hmm, you know, you know, you don't, you know, you, get, you have to get rid of these uh, these kind of split assumptions that we have about things. Um, but when Dionysus is co-opted um, by that way of thinking, then he becomes a figure uh, that has to deal with immortality and salvation, um, which is, you know, I, I still have, I have, if you want to know my opinion, I have mixed feelings about that. But anyway, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to start babbling. Um, I want to thank you all for, uh, for listening again this week. If you like my work and you would like to help contribute, um, please visit patreon.com slash Uh, I have a link at the end of the YouTube video. Um, and I also, um, will have it, you know, have it posted elsewhere. Um, and chthonia.net is my, uh, you know, is my home base where I bring all of my work together. Uh, which includes not only the podcasts, I go in, I have a little video where I talk about the Chthonia concept. Um, I link out to my publications that I have, because um, I, I have, a, there's Chthonia books, I actually publish, um, I, I, right now I've mainly published my own fiction, but I'm, you know, willing to take other material as well. Um, and Chthonia books also has, uh, you know, Chthonia website also, you know, also links out to my liminal Reiki site, which is where um, I work with people one on one on their issues of dealing with boundaries and crossing and, and so forth. So you can check that out as well, if that seems to resonate with you. Um, and eventually, Chthonia will uh, incorporate a teaching component that's being postponed for a little while, but, um, but there will be more on that in the future. Um, if you want to follow me on social media, Chthonia Podcast, one word on Instagram and Twitter, two words on Facebook, and it's just Chthonia on YouTube. Uh, thanks. I want to give a big shout out and thanks to all my patrons, including some of the new ones who have signed up recently. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all of your support, and we'll talk to you in the next episode.